Welcome to another episode of Islam 101, where we're teaching the fundamentals and the basic tenets of the religion of Al-Islam, making an attempt to give a crystal clear and concise understanding of the fundamentals of the religion, so that any new Muslim, any revert Muslim, any non-Muslim who's interested in knowing about the topics that we present for discussion can get a better understanding as to the insight that these, these issues are concerning. Today, inshallah, we're going to deal with the misconceptions of Al-Islam. We already did one episode where we dealt with a few of those misconceptions. And because of the demand for such a topic, we've gotten a few requests. So we're going to do a second episode. Today, inshallah, the topics of discussion, inshallah, are also very important, similar to the ones that we dealt with in our last episode. One of the many misconceptions that people have about Al-Islam, and when we talk about misconceptions in the people, we're not only talking about non-Muslims, we're talking about Muslims as well. So we're going to deal with both groups. There is the misconception that people have, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, that Al-Islam is a religion, but a person's application and his practice of Al-Islam is and should be in his heart and his heart only. No religion really requires that a person has to make any effort or commitment to show his religion and his behavior. Islam is in the heart. If I don't pray, I still believe in Allah and Islam is in my heart. Why should I have to pray? Those are the mechanics and they are of lesser significance and importance. The fact is that as long as I believe in Allah and I truly believe in him in my heart, then it's enough that I believe. A woman, she doesn't practice her religion. She doesn't wear the Islamic attire or the hijab. She says that my heart is white as well. And she would even swear by Allah and say, Well, Lord, I swear by Allah that I believe in Allah and I believe in the last day. Isn't it enough for me just to say that with my tongue and to believe it inside of my heart? No one knows what I really believe except Allah. These types of concepts. We have people of other religions who make the same claim that they don't practice their religion and they claim, well, my religion is in my heart. My, my heart is white and as long as I believe, then I'm going to be okay. As it relates to the religion of Al-Islam, this is not acceptable for a person to simply say, I believe. Because if you were to look at the book of Allah, the Quran, you will find a number of stories and incidents in which the Quran is telling about discussions that shaitan or iblis, Satan, some of the discussions and statements that he made. The story of Adam and Eve, there's a discussion between the devil, shaitan, and Adam and Eve. Discussion uh, also we have of shaitan inciting people and encouraging people to disobey Allah. And every single time that things transpire like when the two armies were about to do battle, the Muslim army and the non-Muslim army, shaitan would incite the non-Muslim army to do battle with the Muslim army. And that's why they were trying to extinguish the light of Islam because shaitan came to them and whispered to them as he whispers to many people and says to them, don't accept the religion of Al-Islam and don't forsake the religion of your forefathers. People are going to laugh at you if you become a Muslim. What are your parents going to say? What are your neighbors going to say? If you become a Muslim, you know how much your people hate Muslims and how much they hate Islam. Therefore, you should not be a Muslim. So what that individual does, instead of using his God-given intellect to say, look, I want to check out seriously what the religion is saying and I'll make an educated assessment. Yes, I'll become a Muslim. No, I don't become a Muslim. Most people, what they'll do is they'll listen to the whispers of a shaitan. Anyway, the point is, shaitan would whisper to the warring faction, the warring party. And then before the battle would take place, shaitan would see the angels that were on the side of the believers, on the side of Muhammad. 
and on the side of those who believed with him from his companions, as the angels in the past used to come to the defense and they used to come to help the righteous people of the past, whether it was Jesus or Moses or Aaron or whoever it was, the angels are on the side of the believers because they themselves are believers. When Shaitan had the ability to see what was about to transpire, that the army of the Muslims, the army of the believers is going to vanquish the army of the disbelievers. Shaitan would say, verily, I see what you don't see. Verily, I fear Allah and he will go away. So he said with his mouth, he said and he articulated that he believed in Allah. But his actions were opposite of that. So if it was enough for a person just to say, especially for you Muslims and you believe in what I just told you about the Shaitan and the discussions that he's being told, we're being told that he had in the Quran. How can we say it's enough for just to say for a person to only say, I believe? Shaitan used to say, I believe. He used to say, Why should I bow down to Adam? He said to Allah, Why should I bow down to Adam when you, you created him from mud and you created me from fire? So he recognized the ubudiyah of Allah, the fact that he owes servitude to Allah, that he was a slave to Allah. Another example of that is Fir'aun, Pharaoh, that oppressive, oppressive, tyrannical ruler who put the people of Beni Israel, the Israelites, he put them in bondage and set them to terrible and difficult task. And then Moses was sent to him all alone to take them out of bondage. That's in the Bible. The story is in the Bible. The story is in the Quran. Anyway, before Pharaoh was destroyed, as the Quran mentioned, Pharaoh said, I believe in the Lord of Moses and in the Lord of Harun. I believe in the Lord of Moses and in the Lord of Aaron. That was before he was drowned. That's a verse in the Quran. So he established with his statement, with his tongue, that he has Iman. But that Iman or that faith at that particular time, it doesn't count. Why? Because as we mentioned before, Iman, faith, consists of the statement with your tongue. You have to say you believe. And it also consists of your heart. And if you really have Iman or faith in your heart, then it's going to show on your limbs and in your limbs. There's no doubt that everyone is going to make sins and they're going to make mistakes. There's no human being who is perfect. Allah said in the Quran, if he was to take all of the human beings to account for what they've done, he wouldn't leave on the earth a single dab. He wouldn't leave on the earth a single human being. That's everyone. Everyone is falling short to some extent concerning their creation as it relates to the servitude that is owed to Allah. So with that being the case, brothers and sisters and my respective viewers, with that being the case, faith is something that has to be shown on the limbs. You may make mistakes, but you still have to make efforts. You have to make the prayer. You have to fast. The woman has to wear hijab. You have to believe what Allah has legislated as it relates to the position of the man and the position of the woman and what it has, what Al-Islam is telling the woman, what she can do, what she can do as it relates to her husband. And other than that, the oppressive rulers who are Muslims from amongst the Muslims, even though we may not necessarily like what's going on, there's a particular way that we have to act and there's a way that we can't act against them. We can't revolt against them. Your faith in your iman, your belief in Allah would necessitate and dictate that behavior. And perfection is only with Allah. We're all going to make mistakes. So faith consists of actions. It's in your heart and it's also on your tongue. Another misconception that people have is that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa brought the Quran and all he did was he mixed and he matched what was said in the previous books the Torah and the Injil, the Bible, the New Testament, the Old Testament. There were some Jews who were with him there in Medina. There were some people who were Christians in Mecca, like Waraka ibn Nufil, the cousin of Khadija. May Allah be pleased with both of them because they were Muslims and Waraka is a Muslim and he's in paradise, inshallah. Rasulullah said, I saw that there are two paradises for Waraka ibn Nufil. So he is a Muslim. These people were in contact with Prophet Muhammad. Waraka was one of the first people who Rasulullah engaged in a discussion about what was revealed to him. So some people say Rasulullah just plagiarized and he mixed and matched what went before him. We say, first of all, the Prophet of Al-Islam, Muhammad, he was commissioned and ordained by Allah. And that means that he came from the same angle 
with the same message that all of the other prophets and messengers came with. The source is one. The source is one. Moses was sent from the source of you're a human being, you're an example, you're a Nebi, you're a Rasul, the prophet and the messenger. You go and explain to the prophet, to the people what Allah wants and be the example for the people. Muhammad was nothing other than that. So what is wrong with the fact that each religion has some overlying similarities and some parallels? Moses came with a religion and the Bible said that Jesus said in the New Testament, this is what the Bible says, that Jesus said, I have not come to change the Old Testament a dit or a dot. I have not come to change the Old Testament a dit or a dot. The Old Testament is what it is. You shouldn't drink alcohol. You shouldn't eat swine. You shouldn't make fornication. You shouldn't make adultery, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. Jesus said that according to the Bible. But the change has been made. The point that I want to make is, why don't people say, Jesus also plagiarized the religion of Moses. No, we say, this is oppressive. The fact that their religions parallel and overlie and they support each other, that's one of the clear proofs that they're all sent from the same creator, from the same one who sent to mankind the books and the nur or the light of Al-Islam to make things clear. So we don't have a problem with embracing that concept and in understanding that concept. But the religion of Al-Islam came and it abrogated all of the other religions that came before. Every religion was consistent about belief in Allah, belief in the last day, belief in the books, belief in the prophets, belief in the divine decree. As it relates to issues of the ideology, nothing ever changes. But as it relates to the ahkam of the religion, the rules and regulations, what you can eat, what you cannot eat, what you can wear, what you can't wear, as it relates to these issues, then there have been some changes. But the basic ideology, ideological concepts, they remain constant. And all of the prophets, they call to that. Another misconception that we find that people say that Muslims believe that all Muslims are good, and all non-Muslims are evil, inherently evil. That all Muslims are good and all non-Muslims are inherently evil. This is not true and it needs some explanation. First of all, we have a number of verses in the Quran. Like Allah said, from the people of al Kitab, from the Jews and the Christians, are those people who, if you left one of them with a whole hoard or a heap, a treasure, a big treasure, you left it as a trust, as an amana. When you come to get it, he's going to give it back to you. Even though you left him a large sum of money. And from people from Al-Kitab, the people from Al-Kitab, Jews and Christians are those people, that if you left them one dinar, one dollar, one jenei, one pound, if you left him one pound, he won't give it back to you unless you stood over him demanding it. That's because some of them say we have no responsibility. We don't have to do right by the people who are not from our religion. So that's the fairness and the justice of Al-Islam that it goes to show that there are some trustworthy Jews and some trustworthy Christians. And there are some Jews and Christians who are not trustworthy. And we'll come back, inshallah, to pick up upon this point when we return for the second episode or the second part of this particular episode. And we look forward to having you come back, inshallah, with us. Islam 101 Be proactive How to be uh, proactive in Islam, how to serve our religion, how to serve uh, our life No, we want them to be proactive in matters that are related to their ummah The true leader, and this is maybe we need to have this okay, among us as Muslims the true leader is the one who creates leaders. So the society at the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, gave the chance for the children exactly. to blossom. Now who took the reward of this? The initiative of Ali bin Abi Talib. Ali bin Abi Talib took the reward because of his initiative. How long have you been passive? How much time have you lost in your life because of negativity? Learn how to take conscious control over your life. Set your goals and work to achieve them in an Islamic way. If you really love your wife, your children, your parents, your people, then you have to do your utmost. You have to do whatever you can in order to invite them to Islam. We are in need for this reminder. The main point is ikhlas, is sincerity. 
is what I want to get in the hereafter. Join Sheikh Haytham Al Haddad and his host Muhammad Abdul Rahim in this inspiring show. Islam 101. Welcome back to Islam 101. Well, we've been discussing some of the misconceptions, the misconceptions that people have concerning the religion of Islam. Whether those misconceptions emanate from Muslims or non-Muslims, it's not the issue. The point is that we want to shed light on these particular aspects of these misconceptions here at Islam 101. Another misconception that we hear people mention many times is that Muslims believe in the Trinity. We hear this from certain Christians, that Muslims, we believe in the Trinity. And they also say that we as Muslims, we worship the black stone. So we are actually polytheists. We're mushrikun because we pray to the black stone that is in the Kaaba or the sacred mosque. They say that we believe in the Trinity because so many ayahs of the Quran, so many verses say, Allah says, verily we did this. Verily we revealed the remembrance and we are going to protect it. Verily we revealed it. We revealed it in the night of power. We. So this is referring to the Trinity. We say, first of all, how is it that a person can take this verse in Arabic, twist it around and make it fit his desires because he's calling to the Trinity? How is that? That's like causing the proverbial square to fit into the round peg. It's going to fit no matter what. You're not qualified to come and tell us you don't know the Arabic language and you're going to come and tell us what it means. What these verses actually mean is something that used to be a practice in the language of the Arabs. Before Prophet Muhammad even came to his people with the religion, the Arabs used to use this word. They call it in English, the royal we, the royal we. A person may want to show himself to be bigger than what he is actually, what he actually is, inshallah. So when he wants to tell people, he wants to know, uh, are you a good wor warrior? Are you a good worker? I'll say to him, and I'm the one who's doing the speaker, the speaker. Yes, when we do work for people, we do a good job. This is in their poetry and this is in their writings. So with that being the case, no one could come now afterwards and say that this means the Trinity and this was a part of the language of the Arabs. And it's something that it is in English. William Shakespeare used to do the same thing in some of his plays. That's why they call it again in English, the royal we. And it is used to denote a ta'veen. So when Allah, the Most High says, we revealed the Quran, he's talking about him. And that's showing the ta'veen of Allah the greatness and the magnificence of Allah. As it relates to us worshiping the black stone, this is the furthest thing away from the truth. The black stone is simply the direction that the Muslims pray towards. That's it. It is the direction that the Muslims pray towards. We don't prostrate, nor do we bend down. It's not permissible for us to prostrate to any created thing. No prophet, no statue, the fire. We cannot as Muslim prostrate to anything at all. Allah has ordered Adam in the Quran and in the Bible. He ordered Adam to pass straight to the angels. And the devil, Iblis, was also, he ordered the devil, he ordered the angels, I'm sorry, he ordered the angels to pass straight to Adam. And they all pass straight except Iblis, the devil, Satan. But we don't say that they pass straight to Adam to worship Adam. They pass straight to Adam in obedience to Allah. And it's similar to shedding blood in Al-Islam. It's not permissible to shed blood. You can't shed anyone's blood, have his blood spilled on the earth. But there are certain times when shedding blood becomes a religious issue. It becomes the deen. It becomes worship. For an example, in Al-Islam, we circumcise our babies. And when you go to circumcise the baby, there's going to be blood. That is the blood that's permissible to shed. Someone has a bad tooth. His tooth is decaying. So he wants to get it out so the decay won't spread to the other parts of the body. Al-Islam allowed that blood to be shed. So now the shedding of the blood becomes the religion because Allah allowed it. Or Allah ordered it in the case of the circumcision. So prostrating to Adam became worship because Allah ordered it. But it was a prostration of respect, a prostration of worship and obedience. Similar to that is the black stone. We prostrate 
towards the direction, keeping ourselves united amongst ourselves. So we're going to open up the door now. There are a lot of other misconceptions, but we'll see what our panel, what our students have to say and what they have to order. What they have to order. We're going to start with my brother Muhammad al Afghani. Yeah, my question is uh, why hijab is made obligatory for women? Concerning the hijab of the woman, some people may say this is oppressive, especially in the summertime or especially in places where the heat is uh, hard and is, is hard to bear, it's unbearable. Why should she have to wear hijab in Florida? Why should she have to wear hijab in the climates of Saudi Arabia where the temperature reaches 130 degrees Fahrenheit? This is oppression. Well, in actuality, this is honoring the woman. This is honoring the woman in that it puts a cover over her just as we would cover up a diamond or anything else that is expensive or important. We do not put it on display. We don't put it on display. When a man sees a woman who's covered up, the first thing that he does is he comes to know the worth of that particular woman from the inside. He doesn't fall in love with her because he sees her beauty the size and the shape and the form and the contours of her body. So because she's voluptuous, he falls in love with her. And that's all she's reduced to in his eyes. No, we're going to see the content of her creed and the way her character is. Because what's going to come out to us is what is on the inside of that woman because we do not see what's on the outside. So Allah ordered the woman to wear the hijab, to wear the Islamic garb. And again, I remind you, it is not... Strange that we see the pictures of Mary, and I don't necessarily believe that those pictures of Mary are correct. The color is incorrect for the most part from the description that was given in the Bible about Jesus. And the color that we knew the Hebrews were, they are not like the pictures. That's institutionalized racism. Someone to believe that Jesus was a white person with blue eyes and blonde hair. That is not consistent with the Bible. But yet the person, whenever you tell him, close your eyes and imagine Jesus and he's a Christian, he imagines a white person. That's part of the institutionalized racism. And it's part of the contradictions that the people have in their practice and what the Bible is saying. And I don't say that to offend anyone. I say that as food for thought. But we do believe that that picture of Mary is similar and consistent with how the women used to dress back there in a moderate and a modest way. Okay, Achi, Noor. No really yes, yeah. my, my question, uh, some Christians said that why Muslims worship Kaaba. I think you have explained it. And I have another question, maybe, uh, who has the right to make uh, some inter uh, interpretations of Quran, Holy Quran? Because somebody, uh, some Muslim, like, I have the right to, to in, uh, interpret Holy Quran, uh, depend on his opinion. That's a good question, Noor. As it relates to who has the right to interpret the Quran, the one who has the right is the one who is well endowed, the one who has a good command and a good knowledge of the Arabic language. He also has a good knowledge, a found and sound knowledge of the books of tafsir, those books that explain the Quran. He doesn't necessarily have to be a scholar, but the first people who are most qualified to explain the Quran are the ulama, the scholars of Islam, especially the mufassirun from them. Those people, it was their job. They took it upon themselves to be experts in the explanation of the Quran, starting with the companions. And then after them, the other scholars also from those who were taught by the companions, they gave us explanations of the Quran. So a person today, he has to have a good work and knowledge about that. Also, in addition to having knowledge of al-Islam, knowledge of the Arabic, he has to have knowledge of sound knowledge of the authentic sunnah because the sunnah explains the Quran. He has to have a sound knowledge of the science of what is known as asbab al-nuzul, why certain verses were revealed. When you know why the verse was revealed, you understand the true meaning of that particular verse. So it's not for everyone to come forth and take liberties with the Quran. Abu Bakr May Allah be pleased with him. Is from the most intelligent Arabs and the best companion. He said, when he was asked about, he was asked about one word of the Quran. He said, what sky is going to protect me? And what, and what earth is going to protect me? Which sky is going to be there to protect me? And which earth is going to protect me if I was to mention one thing about the Quran that I don't know about? They asked him about... They asked him about one of the words of the Quran, an explanation of the Quran. He said, I don't know. They said, you don't know Abu Bakr? He said, I don't know. You think I'm just going to say something about the Quran and I don't know? 
if I were to take the liberties to say something about the Quran that's not correct, or I don't know, which sky is going to protect me from Allah's anger and his wrath? Which earth can I open up and go in to hide from Allah? Which one? So we have to be very careful concerning that. Steve. I'm, I'm, I'm Christian. I want to know if it's possible to marry the Muslim or not. Uh, concerning this particular question, is it possible or permissible for a non-Muslim man to marry a Muslim woman? No, this is not permissible. This is not something that is allowed in the religion of Al-Islam. The Muslim woman, she can only marry the Muslim man who is upright in his character. She can't even marry a Muslim man if he's known to be a fornicator or an adulterer. There's a Muslim man, her cousin, someone from the community. He's a Muslim. He believes in Allah. He prays. He does all of that. But the people of the neighborhood, they know that he commits adultery or fornication. He's doing it right now, and it's a well-known fact that that's what he's doing. If he goes to seek that girl's hand in marriage, Allah said it's not permissible. This is not permissible for the believing men and the believing women to marry that type of individual. So not only can she not marry the non-Muslim man, but she can't even marry the Muslim man who is a fornicator. Why? Because the Muslim woman, she is protected the issue of the hijab, she's a person who is looked at in the society, looked at by her family members as being more precious than a diamond, platinum, or anything like that. So it's not permissible. And another reason behind that is because maybe the Muslim man who does fornication will be a trial for her in her religion. He may give her a disease. He may cause her to leave her religion. He may cause her to disobey Allah. That's with the Muslim man. So what about the other man who's a non-Muslim? He's a non-Muslim, and he doesn't even see the impermissibility of drinking wine. He's a non-Muslim, but he drinks wine. You never know what's going to happen to him when he drinks wine. He says it's okay to take drugs. He doesn't see that as something that's against his religion. His book says it's not permissible, but he's saying, I can still do it. So we don't put her in that position because we don't want her to be tried in her life or in her religion. And for the most part, that individual will take her away from her religion. That's what Allah said, that those people, those people invite you to the hellfire. So when it's time for Christmas, she's married to a non-Muslim man. It's time for Christmas, they're going to put the Christmas tree up. They're going to put pictures about Santa Claus, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I don't know what Santa Claus has to do with Jesus being born on December 25th and all of that, but she's going to have to listen to and obey what her husband was saying, and that's going to be a trial and a tribulation in her religion. And Allah knows best. Okay, Eamon, do you have a question okay. as well? What's different when you read the Quran by the Arabic language and another language? Is it permissible to read the Quran in another language? Mm. Yes, it's permissible, but... The reward of reading the Qur'an is tremendous in Al-Islam. To pick up the Qur'an and to read it, you get 10 hasanat, 10 rewards, 10 blessings for each character, for each harf. Alif, Lam, Mim is 30 blessings. Alif is 10, Lam is 10, Mim is 10. When you read it in another language, that is not the case. But still, as reverts, as people who don't understand Arabic, you still should read the Qur'an in your language but you have to do your best to be diligent, to try to learn the original language of the Qur'an. You have to learn the language of the Qur'an. We're going to bring this episode now to a close, the episode concerning the misconceptions in the religion of Islam. We thank you for your participation and for tuning in, and we hope to see you in our next upcoming episode of Islam 101, inshallah. Wassalam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> Islam.